Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I have the privilege and the honor to welcome, I believe, one of the most strongest prophetic voices, leaders, pioneering in and across the world. Uh, I've been following her ministry for quite some time now. We have mutual friends. I'm up to date with what she has been doing and saying in the kingdom. And this is a huge honor for me to be able to welcome this week's guest, Miss Emma Stark, all the way from Scotland. Our time is a little different, but nevertheless, I'm excited to have Miss Emma with us. Would you welcome uh, the prophetic, the strong, anointed voice, powerful voice and woman of God, Miss Emma Stark. So good to have you here on the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is an absolute joy to be here. And yes, I am sitting in a very cold Glasgow in Scotland. We don't get an awful lot of sunshine. And I've married this Scottish man, uh, but this accent, Ryan, is Irish. I am born and bred on the North Coast. So listeners, today it's all the Celtic vibes. It's the warrior Irish and the warrior Scots all mixed together. <laughs> I love it. My heritage is Irish and Scottish as well. Uh, so I love it. It means something to me personally, uh, those regions and stuff. But for everybody else that may not be familiar with your ministry, can you give a little bit of a background of who you are, what you're doing, and let's kind of hear about the Emma story. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And just interrupt me. I'm fourth generation Bible teacher, rich, rich legacy. And um, my father's actually a senior theologian uh, and travels the world, uh, you know, lecturing at Bible colleges. So I'm, 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 I'm washed in that. And uh, I love the church. I love the church. Uh, but I run here the Global Prophetic Alliance. Uh, and we are responsible for an international network of prophetic people that uh, relate to my husband and I here. I also run the British Isles Council of Prophets, so I am responsible for uh, the well-being of the prophetic in this nation. And uh, I also run a church. I know it's a busy life. So I'm a church leader as well as a ministry leader, as well as an itinerant, you know, uh, uh, preacher as well. But what that means is, Ryan, anything and everything to do with the prophetic, that's what we do. We prophesy all day, every day, you know, over everything that moves. That's the, that's the story. But I grew up cessationalist. I mean, we did not really know about the Holy Spirit. I mean, we were the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures, you know, and who, who was the Holy Ghost, you know? And it wasn't until my later teenage years, I'm in my mid-40s. I know I don't look old enough. I'm in my mid-40s, married for 22 years, uh, teenage children. And, uh, you know, it wasn't till in my late teens, early 20s, that I was like, oh, there's a spirit. Why did nobody tell me this? You know, uh, when I met John Wimber in, in the early nineties and, and exploded then into this new dynamic of wow, visions and the voice of God and stuff like that. How do you take that kind of background and really position yourself to say, okay, this goes against everything that I know previous to this time, but I'm going to do my best to receive. How do, how do you really position yourself to say, okay, I'm open to this? Because a lot of people, they struggle, even though they hear about the move of God, the spirit of God, they yes. still go, this goes against what I believe. So how did you specifically say, I'm going to receive, even if I don't understand? I think in all of us, we, we come to a place where we get wrongly familiar with God and we shut ourselves down from the breadth of who he is so if I was to ask the listeners today tell me the top 
five ways you think about God, uh, there, there's going to be a, a certain five that we will get. It's the same when I ask the question all over the world. In other words, we get this narrow sense. We get this narrow sense of, I know him as father. I know him as friend. I know him as rescuer. I, I maybe know him as miracle worker. And maybe I know him as love. But actually, we, we are very stale in our biblical understanding. Now, do, have you met God as the Isaiah spirit of burning? I mean, have you met him in that manifestation? Have you met God as the Isaiah 42 laboring woman where God is in childbirth you know have you met god who smells and and psalm 45 tells us what jesus smells like he smells like myrrh and aloes and cassia and so i think i've always read scripture with this sense of god give me biblical curiosity i mean that's the prayer god make me biblically curious god make me biblically normal and those prayers of biblical curiosity and biblical normalcy normal they they they, they are, allow you the space to be taken outside of your familiar box you have to pray big prayers so that when new things come in, you don't go, uh, no, I'm not having that. God make me biblically curious and God make me biblically normal. And that allows your spirit to come to a place of receptivity rather than shut downness. And I think I was raised like that to have that kind of thought process. I do not know all there is to know about God. And I understand that I'm probably over familiar in certain small areas. And I have lost loads of the rest of who he is. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. And you're saying that when you're saying biblical curiosity, that's kind of speaking to me in a way because I feel like there's a lot of individuals that their Christian walk, their Christian life, is really based off what they hear other men and women of God say, and they don't really understand what the Word of God itself says. Do, yes. you, do you see that a lot? Oh, totally, t totally. And, and that sense of, you know, when I ask for a show of hands, and maybe you've done this in some of your meetings, you know, who falls asleep when they read the Bible? And, and you'll probably get about 80% of hands that go up. And you see the absolute contention that the word of God has over it by demonic forces. And that sense of most of us get distracted. Most of us, you know, um, struggle to find that focus point. And so most of our Bible reading moments are hotly contested, you know, uh, as we sit down to engage in them. And if you know that Bible reading is hotly contested, you, you know, Know that people are not seeing the fullness of who God is and we we learn our theology often from another man versus actually the Word of God so how does I, I'm thinking back because there is this fine line um, there's there are, are definitely many theologians or scholars there's individuals who are students of God's Word they know the Scripture backwards and forwards. They know, yeah. as, as we would say, from Genesis to the maps, they know the word of God. Yeah. But the thing is, they don't, aren't really opening, for, opening themselves for the move of God, the prophetic, the apostolic, yeah. the signs, wonders, and miracles. How, how is it that we can know so much scripture, yet not really know the power of Holy Spirit? Yes, I mean, the, that's religiosity, isn't it? And religiosity and, and the spirit of religion is all about information versus revelation. And we have a whole teaching structure within the body of Christ, which is based on how much information and knowledge can I put into your ear holes and we measure sermons by informational content rather than by their ability to steward revelation and that you need to kill the religious you need to kill the religious spirit because actually we think if i have a transfer of knowledge 
it's fine. And actually the word of God is about a transfer of sight, is about a transfer of seeing, and is about a transfer of hearing for yourself. And of course, Hebrews 5.14 is, is, is fascinating in this. And, and it says this, solid food, and of course we all go like, well, I would, I would like solid food. And it goes on, solid food is for the mature. Now you and I would love to be kind to mature. Solid food is for the mature. How does it go on? Who went to Bible college? No. Solid food is for the mature who listen to lots of sermons. No, not at all. The word of God says solid food is for the mature who trained their senses. And it, it's like a battering ram at our traditions, isn't it? It's the wrecking ball of heaven swinging to smash through the church that says, it's about training your senses. And we're all like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't like that. That scripture is in there one little bit because I would like to train my intellect. I mean, I'd like to train my knowing. I'd like to train my mind. I want to take detailed sermon notes. Now, as good as that is, maturity and solid food is only given to those who will open their senses to be trained by God that you may see and smell and taste and touch at that, at that experiential side of God that we go now hang on a minute here we don't want to be too experience orientated you know it's a little bit unsigned and yet God is saying no it's a Despite experiencing me, you know, and that actually when you and I walk down the aisle to marry, you know, Jesus, we are not walking up the aisle with a resume of how much information we, you know, at the front when, when we're marrying Christ. It's not a submission of my documentation of how schooled I was. You know, I'm part of a marriage ceremony. It's about how much my senses came alive to know him. And so I do think we have to really blast through the concepts of knowledge without encounter. And let me read, I'm just going to look up Psalm um, 119. I'm sure I should have memorized it. Uh, prizes to your listeners who have memorized Psalm 119 uh, as the longest book. But Psalm 119 uh, 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 verse 18 says this, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. It doesn't say open my head that I may know. It says open my eyes that I may see. And the, even the word of God sets itself up that how you know it is by sight and revelation that wonders are revealed, not by scholarly, uh, uh, you know, thinking. Uh, and I think we are going to see a, uh, the Spirit of the Lord says there, we are going to see a new breed of preacher arise who has come to the pulpit, not with information, but with revelation. And the Lord is wiping the deck of those who use their pulpit to defend Defend denominational lines, and the Lord says, I will put preachers in the pulpit who have come because they have encountered me. Mm, my goodness. So, you're going to have these individuals that are, you know, we've swung the pendulum this far and this far, and, and you know, you have the plumb line and all this. And my mind automatically goes when I was in Ireland not uh, a couple years ago. We had a prophetic retreat and the individuals that were there were all prophetic in some kind of um, understanding. So we get there and there's this group, there's about 50 of us and they uh, are not really kind of catching on what's happening. And all of a sudden uh, the word fire is said, when fire is said, they all react to it. They all go, Oh, schwo, you know, Hey, yeah. And, and you're like, Whoa, wait a minute. What's happening? And, and you realized that there was a lack of knowledge of the word, but they were very, very heavily, you know, into um, the other side of swindling the pendulum too far. And yeah. so I had asked a simple question. I said, how many gifts of the Holy Spirit are there? No one could answer it. That No one knew. So then I said, okay, let's talk about the gifts. What are they? Of course, they said prophesy. 
And they said, speaking in tongues, interpretation tongues, but they couldn't name the other six. So I said, okay, where, where is that at in scripture? No yes. one knew. No one knew. I said, wow. okay, let's talk about the gifts. I mean, the fruit of the spirit. No yeah. one knew the fruit of the spirit other than love. That was the only one that was mentioned. They couldn't tell me where it was at in scripture. Oh, and so God. there is, and there is this, this, this pendulum that, that goes, you have those that are very knowledge, 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 anti anything moved in the Holy spirit, anti anything apostolic prophetic. Yeah. Then you have the swinging of the pendulum that they're very heavily apostolic prophetic, but they're not very interested in knowing the word of God. Yes. So what do you say to those individuals that are, I want to be everything, you know, spirit, 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 but I'm not going to be that encouraged by the word. How would, I mean, what do you say to those individuals? I would read the Ma Matthew twenty two twenty nine, which says this, you are in error. And we're all like, Woo -hoo -hoo, Jesus never said that about me. You are in error. How does it go on? Because you do not know the word of God and you do not know the power of God. And Jesus in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, he, he collides and crashes together where you will be judged for your error. That if you do not know the word of God and you do not know the power of God together, you are before him, at, you know, uh, uh, something that he wants to rebuke, you know. And I think there, there has to be this place where we say, I've got to know the power of God. I mean, I have got to know the power of God because if I do not know the power of God, I'm in error. That means I need to know the gift in that gift list in Corinthians that you were alluding to that is called miraculous powers. Do we even know there's a gift called miraculous powers that's separate from healing, that's separate from prophecy? When Jesus says you're in error because you don't know my power, have you ask for the gift of miraculous powers. To me, the gift of miraculous powers is changing weather patterns or walking through walls or walking on the water that actually, if I do not contend to receive that, I'm in error, but I am, which is wild stuff, but I am equally in error if I have not set my heart on a pilgrimage of knowing the word of God. That, you know, that I am, I, I will be shaken and I will be unsustainable if I do not know both, both together. And we got all these things, you know, where people although you heard me talk about training our senses, we train our senses to know what is God and what is not God. We do not train our senses so we can talk to the dead. It's biblically forbidden. You know, so we, we have to come to that place of understanding the absolutes in scripture so that our, our encounters are robust. If you don't know the absolutes in scripture, your encounters will lead you into deception without a shadow of a doubt. I absolutely love this conversation. This, is, <laughs> this fires me up. It, it, I mean, you are in a country that most definitely uh, understands a lot about witchcraft and how it can oh, manipulate yeah. what God is saying and what God is doing and understanding that if you're going to flow in the gifts of Holy Spirit, if you're going to be prophetic, apostolic, you also got to be able to recognize what truly is God. However, here in the States, we have a tendency to kind of renounce the demonic. We have a tendency to renounce witches, warlocks, and so on and so forth. Because honestly, I am of the mindset that most people don't want to acknowledge witchcraft because it would cause them to have to deal with real issues and get off their prescription medica medication. Ooh. Oh, now, now you're preaching. Now but, you're preaching. you know, there is good medicine. I'm not knocking all medicine. But the truth is, we don't want to go through and overthrow what we have the power and ability to do because we are satisfied in self-medicating. I'm saying that to say, um, it, 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 in a culture that has the tendency to not know the word and also not be able to recognize the witchcraft and the demonic side of things. How is it so, or why is it so important for you to operate through the gifts of Holy Spirit, through the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding in this to understand that this truly is God? 
Yes, I mean, lots of questions in there and lots of thoughts. We spent an awful lot of time rescuing witches out of covens. It's, it's, it's been a large part of our ministry life. And uh, going into the New Age and the psychic fairs, which here in Scotland are very heavy because the, the witchcraft is so old here. And so for years, we've taken stalls. Now, I would be very careful in saying that we, don't, we do not play at their language. I am not going to give you a spiritual reading because that's unclear about where my power is sourced. I am a Christian who is going to give you a prophetic word from Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the witches and the warlocks have swarmed around us and they'll say, we like your aura. And I'm like, aura, that is the Holy Spirit, well spotted. You know, so we're used to working in that environment I never met a witch or a warlock anywhere in any of my encounters. He did not understand that Jesus was the top par in the universe. None of them have ever disputed that. Uh, and it's fascinating that they think he's too bright. They think that they're not worthy to connect with him. And Satan has uh, completely brainwashed them that they can only go to his par. And when I say, no, 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 you can connect with Jesus of Nazareth. We have led witches and warlocks out of covens and into faith like that when they come into an understanding that Jesus is accessible. And it's not the issue that they don't acknowledge him. And it's not the issue that they don't believe he's powerful. It's just they believe that they cannot access him. And so we have led a lot of witches and warlocks to faith. Now, in your in that environment, or just, you know, real life, we think that spiritual gifts are optional extras. We think they are the nice add-ons to those who have understood some sort of mystical secret. But the root word of the word charisma, which is translated gift, spiritual gift, charisma, is actually spiritual enablement, spiritual empowerment. And the root of that word partly means to rescue in the New Testament Greek. So the spiritual gifts, you know, the nine of them, they are spiritual enablements or they are spiritual empowerments to enforce the kingdom of God. In other words, you have been weaponized by heaven for the liberation of nations. And we, we come to them thinking, oh, well, I'll take it or leave it. Oh, well, I'll take it or leave it. You know, how dare we say that by what, you know, for what is given to us for the liberation of many. And we think about prophecy completely in a, such a screwed up way. Let me give you an illustration. We think of prophecy like this. I'm going to put on the green glasses of being nice. I'm going to put on the lens of the shepherd, you know, the lens of nurture. These are my glasses of nurture because they're green and pastoral and like a field, you know. And so when I put on the green glasses of nurture, these are my dyslexic glasses, by the way. But when I put on the green glasses of nurture and I try to prophesy, I think, I think nonsense thoughts. I think, how nice can I be? You know, how much can I let you know about the love of God? You know, how kind can we, can we have this little session of this word? So prophecy signs with the green glasses of nurture. You know, the, the, this is the shepherding paradigm I'm talking about. It sounds like this. <gasps> Ryan, I just feel like God really wants you to know that he loves you. And I definitely see a fluffy cloud and there's probably cotton candy, and there's definitely a sailing boat, and a lots of flowers, you know? And then to prove that it's God, because we're so habitual, even with our Holy Spirit manifestations, so that you know it's from God, I might go, whoa, you know, just to prove, because you know, we're so religious. But actually, you've got to strip off that nonsense understanding of the gifts. You've got to strip off that nonsense shepherding lens because you've got to come to those gifts, uh, you know, with the mindset uh, that, that, that prophecy should be used with. And prophecy is a weapon of war. And so a prophet is never thinking, Ryan, how nice can I be to you? You know, how much love can you feel? A prophet turns up and they, or somebody using prophecy turns up and goes, how free can I get you? You know, how liberated can I make you? How 
far can I transition you into the purposes of God? And that is the lens by which you use these weapons of God. It's about liberation and freedom. It's, it's about that sense of, I, you are worth fighting for. You are worth getting free. And we've got to take the lens of the shepherd off the gifts. And we've got to use them with the lens of the prophet and the apostle that's thinking about risk taking, you know, and I think, <laughs> I don't know whether I'm answering your question or not, but, yes. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, we have, we have got to get over our patheticness, lose our nonsense and say, I will not leave captives in chains. I will become a liberator and I will use the weaponization of heaven to do it and i will be straight talking about the power of god and not dilute it under spiritual readings or hide it under other ridiculous language <laughs> where i'm born and raised in the deep south uh you know born and raised in alabama we would say emma you're my kind of people <laughs> you are speaking my language and it, it every single time I have ever watched you and listened to you online or on podcasts, you stir the spirit within me. And so first of all, I just want to say thank you for that because you really do stir that within me. You said something that caught my attention when you, when you mentioned the spiritual readings and the language yeah. and the vocabulary and stuff. Um, some years ago, I was in another country and very, very uh, populated with witches and warlocks. Matter of fact, the largest university in that nation was a witch warlock university. Mm -hmm. And witches and warlocks were assigned to pastors and so on and so forth. And anyway, I go to this one town and the pastor said, we wish you'd been here two days prior. And I said, why? And they said the witches and warlocks had a ceremony in the local town park. Yeah. And they sacrificed a three day old baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of looked at them and I said, well, what did you do? And mm -hmm. the pastor said, what do you mean? What did we do? There's nothing we can do. They're so powerful. So no. I was really grieved by this grieved. I'm talking about grieved. And so uh -huh. I'm, I'm in, I come back to the United States. I'm sitting in the airport. I'm eating breakfast in the airport and my uh, Americanized Christian mm -hmm. arrogance spoke up. And I said to God, as I'm sitting there, and I said, well, at least here in the United States, we're not sacrificing babies. We don't have witches and warlocks sacrificing babies. And yes. Holy Spirit knocked me upside the back of the head and said, yes. no, you call them doctors. Wow, wow, and wow. It just, you know, weeping in the airport. You know, the waitress comes up, are you okay? I'm okay. You know, I'm just broken. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that story because I, I want you to come back and touch on why our vocabulary and language is so important not to, as we would say in the deep South, muddy the waters. In other words, yeah. to try to Christianize a cultural acceptance. You said, for example, the spiritual readings. You don't use spiritual readings. You make sure to be constructive according to the word of God. Why is that so important to be so pure in the way that you're prophetically speaking? I mean, I think you've alluded to, to the answer in the question. It, it is about, it's about purity. And uh, how, how I often say it, it, it in the kind of new age witchcraft community is um, out there are many spirit guides and we know that. And they almost like form a triangle. And at the top of the triangle sits Jesus. And he is the ultimate power and authority in the universe. In the rest of that triangle, you know, uh, uh, sit angels and demons. They're powerful, but they're lesser powers than Christ himself. Yes? And nobody disagrees with that. And very often, you know, a, a lot of these witches and warlocks will have gone to find a spirit guide because you can go to spirit guide finding classes or you can go to and find your angel guide, you know, uh, classes. So that's quite normal. And, and, and those voices are, sit in the bottom of that triangle under, you know, the, they're not as powerful as Christ. And I will say to them very often, you thought you had a pure guide, didn't you, who turned out to be nasty 
and the number of, in the new age and witch, witchcraft community who thought they connected with a archangel or a good spirit and it turned out to be something an entity that did them masses of harm that's a huge proportion of the conversations i've had and so the only way i can navigate that is by absolute biblical clarity about who we are where our part is sourced who is the boss otherwise i am no better than those who train them to find other guides we have got to be able to get rid of all of that now can i tell you there is a large witchcraft community in europe there's also a large witchcraft community in north america where you are there's witches warlocks covens ten a penny and they just are more under the radar it's not that they don't exist but you have all power and all authority in the name of Jesus. And we have got to take that power on and, uh, you know, bring it to its knees rightly and display the Lordship of Christ. Otherwise, we will not be able to reclaim nations. Can I tell, I don't often, hmm, do I ever tell this story? Let me tell you this story. Um, it, it's, um, uh, you know, held back sometimes because uh, you'll understand why i had a woman walk into my office some years ago now I and mean, she said to me um uh i knew her i knew her as a pastor's wife she was she was a pastor's wife in my time and she said to me um uh, i'm also the high priestess of the local coven and i want out of the coven could you get me out and i kind of did a what what what? And she said, I deliberately married the minister on the instruction of the coven to seduce him to destroy church unity within this area. So I went on a journey to get her out of the coven it, 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 and it cost, it cost dearly, but boy, did we have an amazing time. I'd gone round to her house one night and the coven had put a, um, a, a tracker, a demonic tracker stitched uh, under her skin and uh, so that they knew where she was at all points uh, and this is an extreme story and I turn up I had read at that point I'd only read about it about spiritual surgery that you could pray for somebody and the uh, uh, implanted you know uh, objects would come out and they would leave no scar so I thought how hard could it be I'm just going to go and pray, you know, with my team. What's the worst that can happen? So I am praying and this demonically implanted tracking device was moving through the skin, just like I'd read, you know, in one of the books. And, and I'm thinking, Jesus, you're so awesome. You know, this tracking device is popping out of her skin. Then she starts screaming and she says, they're here, they're here. And I'm like, who's here? Who's here? The coven are here because they were terrified of our par. Terrified. I open her back door. The coven are physically there, not in the spirit. They are physically there. They are lined up along uh, the outside of her, her, her garden. They're all in their, their hoods and they are there to do us harm. They are there to physically hurt us. Our lives at that point were in danger. And there's me and two of my team and the entire coven. It is the most like Elijah's show, showdown I have ever <laughs> had, you know? And all we have is a little vial of anointing oil. And I say to my teammate, start throwing that and we'll pray in tongues. So he starts throwing, you know how tiny those little oil things are. He starts throwing it. And, you know, one throw and the whole bottle's gone. Then it's refilled. And then it's refilled. It never ran out. By a miracle, this tiny little thing of oil is refilling. And he is throwing this oil. Well, as it starts to travel, it's only so far you can flick it. It supernaturally goes the entire length of the garden. And as it's landing, it becomes like holy fire. And it is burning the witches alive. And they are starting to scream at the end of the garden, you're burning us, you're burning us. And we're like, this is amazing. You know, God, you're so powerful. So we look at each other and I'm going, I'm on a shield and they, you know, just praying in tongues to keep the atmosphere faith filled. And we're burning them with this, this oil on fire. And then I say, let's do an exclusion zone. 
and uh, we've never done this before, but so in the name of Jesus, we put an exclusion zone of, I think it was about 25 meters. And the entire coven are lifted up and moved 25 meters by the power of God. Now they are screaming. I'm surprised the police didn't turn up. And we're like, this is awesome. Let's do it to a mile. Let's do it to five miles. And that coven were physically removed by a decree. And I, why do I tell that story, Raya, which is so mad. But the, the sense of, of you are so filled with power and authority that that even a coven in the flesh with who are fully weaponized with knives and guns have nothing on the power of God in you and the reason we don't see the witches and the warlocks in in the western nations is because we choose to be blind and we choose to say it doesn't exist and we do not liberate our nations by understanding that I have all power and I have all authority authority because of Jesus. Therefore, somebody else has none. You know, and that's it. It's that understanding. All power. Jesus says all power and all authority. Therefore, your nonsense demons are what I call stick demons. They're easily kickable over, overable stick demons in comparison to the power invested in us wild story right <laughs> i i love it i mean i absolutely love this and and i can hear i can hear so many people saying i just don't know if i could ever do that that's awesome emma you, you know you're confident you're yeah. bold you have this faith you have this i don't know if i could do this uh, I hear so many people say that even in things that I've shared and people go, Oh, that's great. You do it. Great. You know, yeah. awesome. I'll call you yeah. to do it and take care of it for me. Yes. But you're saying something. I really want people to catch on to what you're saying. You're yes. saying that the power of God is in you to do these things. Yes. And we're yes. in, we're a nation, especially right now in, in the States. And I know it's, it's worldwide, but in the States, it, it seems, uh, it seems a little more publicized. I'll use that word. Um, we, we're not acknowledging a lot of the witches and warlocks. And, and, and I know that in this nation, but we're in the midst of a crisis in the sense of a health crisis. We're in the midst of, you know, there's so much fear uh, in people that have no relationship with God, but there's so much fear that is also being exemplified within the body of Christ concerning this virus. Yeah. And the same power, the same power, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. the same power that is in you to do what you demonstrated with that pastor's wife and those witches and warlocks there, yeah. that whole thing, that same power is given unto you to speak against this virus, to be able to go to spiritual warfare in that sense, to decree and declare over your family. So I, I want to ask you, how do you carry that from? the demonic realm to where we are right now, especially in the United States and across the world concerning COVID-19, you know, because there's so much people are, are genuinely afraid to even speak up a lot of times because unfortunately there's many in the church that are criticizing you. If you do exemplify uh, yeah. what appears to be a bold faith and so on and so forth. So how would you articulate to someone in that measure from the demonic to what you're facing right now in this current season. Yeah. I have to say, I don't think the approach is any different, Ryan. I think the demonic is the demonic is the demonic. It doesn't Come matter on. what form it comes in. It doesn't matter whether it comes in the form of a witch standing in a full-blown costume, you know, weaponized, literally ready to shoot me, or whether it's the demon of fear wrapped around your heart, or whether it's stress or intimidation, or whether it's the demonic spirit of silence that has grabbed hold of the church. The, 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 the default position is the same for all of us. I have all power and I have all of authority no matter what form it looks like in you you know and I think for me we have become so intimidated and we have lost the sense of our pioneering wildness 
that, that thinks about taking ground, that thinks about victory. We have lost the mindset of victory. We have lost the mindset of champions. And, and so that we have got to lay hands on our own heads and say, God, give me the mind of Christ that is a victorious mindset, that is an overcoming mindset, that is a bold mindset. You've got to do business here. I mean, right Right here, you got to get your hands on this space and say, renew my mind. You see, in that renew my mind scripture, it is not renew my thought. It, 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 that's really important. It's not, God, I want to think better. God, I've got a little bit of a bad thought. You know, could you just fix my little thought that's gone astray? It's renew my mind. It's the entire process of my internal dynamic that of how I process the world must be renewed and I must have the renewing of the mind and the gift of the mind of Christ that I may think according to scriptural principles. And I here, look, let, let me be honest. Church majoritively is boring. <laughs> It is. It's majoritively boring, you know, and 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 there and you you heard in my introduction. I lead a church. Even my own church in its history has had boring days. And if I wasn't the preacher on the rota or the leader, I wouldn't have turned up to my own church. You know, it is tedious. And at very best, can we just be just honest? At very best, very best. We're underperforming as the church. That's mm. our best. We're underperforming. At worst, uh, we're probably heretical, you know, at our worst moment. So you, you, you're dealing with an underperforming, boring church where most of us go because we, we feel we ought or we should. And, and we kind of think, I'm sure I signed up for something different. Yes, you did. You signed up for a wild, radical adventure in Christ, where you are part of an offensive army, not a defensive army, that is minded in call to take territory and to bring the kingdom of God. And that means you must be alive and alert to spiritual warfare. And it doesn't matter who you are. You do not ever have the permission from God to say, I will leave that to an expert. The call is for all of us. There is as much Jesus in those who are watching this as there is in you and I. I don't have more Christ in me than somebody else does. I have there, it, That is equal across the board. And it is about waking up to what God intended the church to be uh, so that she can become the, the, the force for good in the world right, rather than the bystander who is observing. And so it, it is about you starting to say, this is entry level stuff, how I would train. Kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. I could put money on the fact that we don't bet that your home is not full of righteousness, peace, and joy. Listeners, it's probably full of stress, maybe a bit of fear, you know, anxiety, uh, some perversion, uh, you know, it, so it's not righteousness, peace, and joy. And we think that's just us. That's very often a demonic atmosphere. So you need to get up in the morning and say, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And anything that is not of that kingdom leaves my home right now. That's a spiritual warfare entry level prayer. Anything in this room that is stress, that is anxiety, that is an unsettled heart, that is a lack of peace, that is perversion, I ban you from my home and I speak the atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven into it right now. And you start there. You start by owning your spiritual space that you live in. You start by commanding righteousness, peace, and joy. And the enemy will learn that when you resist him, as the scripture says, he must flee. Now, once you've learned that over your own body and your own home, then it's easy to start to do it outside of that. 
I got two, two more thoughts and, and I promise I will, I will let you go. Cause I know your, your time is very precious. Um, if you could say anything to prophets right now, regardless of where they're at, Western Christianity or uh, Europe or Australia, wherever, um, if you could say anything to prophets, what would you charge them or say to them? Oh, I've, I've, I've hundreds of hours worth of skills. <laughs> Brian. You're asking for one thought. Uh, yeah, we do have an emerging prophet program. I think where I see the Achilles heel of the prophets in the West is they have married the political spirit. Mm. And go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I am uh, personally inviting you to, 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 go to break this down. To break this down. And we prophesy according to political party rather than the higher place of the kingdom of God. We prophesy according to political allegiance and alliance. And God is fed up with it. And if there was a judgment on prophets, it is over this issue. And I will tell you why. Scripture is very clear that morality does not come through the law. And that's really important. It comes through the heart. And when you try to structure your prophetic words to try to empower a political party, political figures, to try to shape law, and you think that will bring morality, or you think that will bring righteousness to a nation, you have not read the word of God. Mm. Because, because morality does not come through the law, morality comes through the heart. And that is the major difference between Islam and Christianity. Uh, so if we understand the differences between our major world religions, Islam comes into a nation and it wants to change the laws. It wants to force from the top down a system and a structure whereby you must behave according to its moral code. Christianity works in the complete opposite. Christianity comes in and it says that you change the morality of the heart and the laws become obsolete. So people don't choose to you know, need the laws because they have moral fabric uh, within them. And, and, and so we have got to understand when we prophesy <laughs> that we are interested in the morality of men, not our political opinions. And a massive, ma that we could spend hours teasing that out together. That is where you get conspiracy theories in agreement with political spirits. That is where you get things that are not right. That is where you get deception. That is where you get the prophets in disrepute because they are, they are supposed to be at heart lawyers for God. They are the, the, the counsel for God. They are his spokesperson, no matter what is happening politically, religiously, morally within a nation. And the very second we become our own spokesperson, you know, God will say, I never knew you. Mm. Massive areas to unpack. Uh, but at but its heart, how does Christianity change a nation? How does Christianity heal a nation? That, that must be understood biblically because we want healed nations. It, it, let me say that again. You cannot legislate for morality. It doesn't work. Hebrews says that. You know, so I actually think that there is a place where, although we, we vote and we vote because that is right to do, that we don't always, as prophets, shout our political alliance or allegiances in a, in, so that they are known. Because once I have nailed my political colors to the mast in the public domain, 
I have lost some of my integrity to be a lawyer for God and I start being a lawyer for that party. My goodness, what a word. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just really the foundational part of that. I mean, that Oh, really, I'm only just getting started on that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, yeah. that's definitely got to be another podcast in and of <laughs> itself um, for yeah, that. A, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have uh, a brand new book that is Ooh, just yes, weeks yes. out. Uh, yeah. Can you give us a little bit of insight about that? I will wave it at you. <laughs> yes. So it's the, it's the Prophetic Warrior. There we go. So you recognize the title. James Gall and Cindy Jacobs wrote the forward for me, which is very sweet of them. And I think every, nearly every thought I've had about the prophetic is in this book. <laughs> it's, it's the point of it. But I really felt like, I was kind of fed up with the, oh, the prophet, oh, the prophet, you know, they'll give me a word. And I think we have for years made prophecy about, can I get a microphone and give me a platform? And we have forgotten that it is this lifestyle of oceans of revelation. It's this lifestyle where I hear his voice and it's so sweet to me. And I, I, I have visions and dreams and encounters and my children hear him and I hear him and my church family hear him. And this whole sense of uh, the, the oceans of revelation that I want people to jump into to realize that they are a voice, they are a solution, they can prophesy. But also I think what is very unique in it is this concept of weaponization that you learn in this, uh, Ryan, this sense of... I am trusted by God to do remarkable things. And, and this will lead you into being um, completely alive in your warrior capabilities. So it's on Amazon. If you want to get it signed, I'm signing all the ones that are coming out from our own website, which is prophetic scots.com prophetic as in scotland prophetic scots.com they're the signed ones but the rest are amazon or wherever you get books in america <laughs> yeah it, it's it, i want to recommend everybody to get this you know one of personally for me one of the greatest lessons i've learned about uh releasing prophetic words is i can say anything that god tells me to say and release at any time but i don't have to say something every single time a microphone is put in my hand. I Amen. have to know the timing of the Lord. Is there a permissible time frame of that? And so for you to be able to share that and put that into a book form, it speaks volumes to me personally, but for everybody else, it, it really is. I love that you said it's a weapon. It really is yeah. a, a weapon in, in your hand. So I want to encourage everybody, look that up. It's on Amazon. It's through Destiny. Image Publishing, it's on there. It'll be in Barnes & Noble, Books books a Million, all that stuff. But if you want that, I will make sure on the YouTube video, you'll see the web address and make sure if you want to get one signed from Emma herself and everything. So I sincerely appreciate you taking time to be a part of the podcast this afternoon. I know that you and I have not met each other in person, but and, and you took a chance. You took a chance on just blindly coming and being a part of this podcast <laughs> Um, so if, if, if there's anything that you want to, uh, you know, hash out with me, just take it up with Jennifer LeClaire and, uh, you know, <laughs> so, uh, uh, some of our mutual friends and, and, and stuff and everything, but I sincerely appreciate it. Give my love and respect to your family, your husband for taking the time say. out as well. Um, hopefully there'll at least be one sunny day in Scotland this year, at least just Please. one. <laughs> So it is a beautiful country, um, and definitely the people there are beautiful as well. We appreciate the time, the effort that Emma has invested. I would encourage everybody to go to her website, check that out. She's in the United States often, and if you can get to a meeting that she's a part of, make sure to make the time to be a part of that as well. She is on Facebook and every other social media platform just about, and um, every day, can you just quickly tell us about what you're releasing every day on Facebook with the uh, prophetic center there? Yeah. Yes. We, we kind of stumbled into par R now. 
uh, excuse my accent, P-O-W-E-R, par. It only has one syllable in an Irish accent, par, r. And we do those um, several times a week. And you can come midday our time, uh, which is very early in the morning for the Americans. But uh, a lot of Apache, a lot of Americans are on getting ready for their day, uh, midday my time. And we are just, you know, chatting. And uh, we, I mean, we're being warriors to help people navigate crisis. That's why we started it. And it looks like we'll be doing it for longer than we thought, you know. <laughs> I thought oh, a few weeks of this. But um, it has uh, uh, got um, a following that has slightly shocked us in the multiple tens of thousands who are with us watching that par R on our platforms. So you can find me on Facebook, Emma Stark. Thanks, Ryan. I know there's probably a lot of people that are saying, what has she been saying this whole time? But everybody from Alabama knows exactly what you're saying. So that Irish in Alabama, I told Emma before we came on that in Alabama, you say power, P-W-E-R. You know, we say power, there's power in the blood. So we understand one another. Uh, I got it because it, it is very, very close. But everyone else, you might have wondered, but I love it. I love the accent. I have an accent. You might as well own it. So it is what it is, but thank you so much for being a part of this. It's an absolute pleasure. For everyone else, I hope that this episode has encouraged you, has challenged you, and has equipped you that you may further advance the kingdom of God. We bless you all in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.